Um, my name is Kristen, Kristen Henry. Uh, I am the host of the uh, breakfast show on Mix 106.3. Is that okay? Um, I am the entertainment reporter for Win. We'll just check my little marks. Is that all good? No. You would think that I would know how to handle myself around a mic, but unfortunately not. Is that all good? I can just yell anyway. Um, <laughs> So where was I? Oh, entertainment rep reporter for Win. Um, I'm a columnist too. I write for Her Canberra and news.com.au um, and Mamma Mia. I, I think though the thing that I'm probably most proud of is that I am Miss Kristen. I teach dance to little boys and girls um, as my hobby. And that for me is something that I just love, like teaching especially these young girls to respect their body, to move their body, to be able to get up on stage and perform, something that you know was given to me as a gift when I was little. Um, so something that I, I love to sort of pass on. And we have a lot of fun as well, shaking our booties. Um, and my best food experience, at the moment I cannot get enough of um, the Parmigiana at the dock on the Kingston foreshore <laughs> because they use the Pialago bacon. Oh, and it's just like the size of my face and I just really, <laughs> I really love it. <laughs> Next. Hi, Kristen. Hi. It's so good to meet you. Oh, good. Hi. Hey. Welcome. Hi, I'm Roseanne Brand. Um, I'm a partner here at PwC in Canberra. Um, I think it, you know, part of my story is I'm a stepmom. So I have four amazing young people that I'm really proud to be a stepmother to. Uh, and I actually see that's you know, one of my kind of central roles in life. Uh, I love sailing. Uh, don't get to do it enough. Uh, and I, I guess in terms of you know, the, the stuff that I, I love to do, uh, one of the things I'm really passionate about is helping government with uh, putting in place some really critical digital infrastructure for our country. So, so thinking about how we actually really enable our economy and get uh, moving in terms of uh, being able to transact and make business better. Uh, for citizens, for businesses, for investors in our country. So that's something I'm deeply passionate about. And, and I'm also, um, I guess a lot of the work that I do is oriented towards social services. So um, I do a lot of work with human services, Department of Social Services, and more recently I've had the absolute privilege in working with um, Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, to me, you know, when you can jump on a plane at the end of the day and send a text to one of your partners and say, I just feel so grateful mm. for, for being able to do the work that I do, it's, it's, it's really quite powerful. Favourite food experience? Uh, I've just got back from a, an amazing holiday in Europe with my husband. Who hasn't? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I will say my favourite food experience was a happens chance to a gorgeous um, tapas bar in Lisbon. Oh, uh, nice. and, how was it in London at the moment? Oh, it's um, it's it, it, there's the stoicism and the the um, the we will not be shaken mm. that is clear and um, and the the there's still buzz and that that's not being beat, mm. but the grief and sadness that mm. came from the Grenfell Tower, yeah. and then their disbelief at what's happened with the, the, um, the, that man who decided to drive his car off the road. That's, that's shaken, I think, the, the core of, uh, of, of people. So there's this stoicism combined with a deep mm. sadness and grief, which is, it's, um, yeah. You know, what can you say? You know. it's well, horrible. it's good to have you here. Oh, I thank you. you. literally just dropped, jumped off a plane, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. I'm um, Holly. A little bit about you. Evening all. This is definitely the most unusual dating arrangement I've been in, but <laughs> great to be here. Um, Holly Ransom, for those of you who haven't met, quite a few familiar faces in the room, which is lovely to see. And thank you all for supporting Country to Canberra. Hannah, I couldn't be more proud of you and what you've yeah. built. It's just sensational. Uh, I run an organisation company called Emergent. Um, we're a specialist consultancy firm. We work predominantly in change strategy and leadership development. And kind of two uh, areas of focus, really, uh, rapidly transforming organisations and intergenerational workforces are sort of our two main areas. Um, probably the, the stuff I'm most passionate around is uh, the privilege of the work I get to do in the education sector in Australia. Uh, I really first jumped into that space when I, uh, the Prime Minister gave me the privilege of leading 
the Youth Summit for the G20 back in 2014, and, and we tried to really ignite this global conversation around youth unemployment and how critical it is that we come up with pathways for young people to work, and we managed to bridge this dramatic skills mismatch we've got going on around the world. Um, and it's, it's still an area, I mean, Jennifer and I were having that chat tonight, that we really need to ramp up the intention and particularly the progress on. We've got a lot of conversation, but it feels a little bit like a, a broken record, unfortunately. Uh, if I was to name my favourite food experience, it's going to be a generic one. I've moved to Melbourne from Western Australia and I feel like if you've managed to keep a restaurant or cafe open for more than six months in Melbourne, it's pretty well guaranteed it's going to be a good thing. <laughs> because it's so competitive down there. I, I found out uh, the other week that there are 10 coffee machines per block in Melbourne. That's how oh caffeine addicted they are in the CBD. Uh, so breakfast out, a brunch on a, on a Sunday with friends in Melbourne or my partner in Melbourne would be my pick of the food experience. Beautiful. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi. So hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Foster. Uh, I guess I was trying to think, what do I say first? So am I a public service tragic, which is probably <laughs> my career problem? Um, or should I say that I'm a obsessive compulsive activity a holic? <laughs> which is Both kind of good. my personal problem. <laughs> I used to think I was a workaholic until I realised that it didn't really matter what I was doing as long as I was doing something, that, mm -hmm. that I was pretty happy. So I love, I love cooking, and eating and drinking and traveling and learning languages and gardening and singing and playing the piano and what I do most of the time actually is work um, and try and squeeze in a little bit of all those other things uh, when I can. The thing I'm most passionate about in the world is about social inclusion mm. and about doing whatever I can to help everyone in the world, no matter what their sex or gender or belief system or religion to achieve their full potential. Um, and so I've really lucked out in, in my public service role in being part of the Public Service Commission, um, where our whole focus is on empowering and enabling um, uh, the public service to be the best it possibly can for the benefit of, of Australia and Australians. Because I love food so much, it's really hard to talk about my favourite experience. You've got a big one, mate. So I'm tossing up between tripe and black truffle. Ooh. Right. Cool. Both good choices. Like Not together. <laughs> Jennifer. Okay, I'm uh, Jennifer Westacott. I'm most famous, I guess, for being the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia, mm. which is the policy advocacy body for 130 of Australia's top companies. I also sit on the board of West Farmers and I chair Mental Health Australia. A very diverse background. I was the sec first woman Secretary of Education in Victoria, ran the housing department in Victoria, New South Wales, etc, etc. Um, what am I passionate about? Uh, same as Stephanie, I'm passionate about people realising their potential, overcoming inequality in our society and I've spent my lifetime, including in this job, uh, to try and fight for people to have uh, a better quality of life through uh, a decent economy. Uh, the thing I'm most passionate about at the moment is uh, my partner and I are running a um, literacy centre for very disadvantaged people, particularly asylum seekers who have been uh, really excluded from our society and it's great to see people you know, who've, had, who've lost hope now being able to go off to TAFE and uh, teaching one of their kids to tap dance uh, the other week as I did uh, and seeing these people who came just feeling so miserable and so depressed uh, suddenly feeling uh, a sense of dignity and purpose in life. In terms of uh, food, um, I think I'm actually a really good cook. It's my only skill, actually. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I've become really good at cooking this fabulous salmon with this Thai salad and this mango salsa and this lime and wasabi mayonnaise oh, and these wow. cumin roast potatoes, and it's fantastic. I'm so looking forward <laughs> yeah. to the second day. I'm free later. Yes. <laughs> when are we coming? Oh, would you like to take any of these ladies out on a second day? Of course. Yes. Yeah, Aren't they wonderful? Um, thank you for joining us, ladies. It is, I think it's always interesting um, when you have these beautiful, successful women um, and you actually ask them to introduce themselves. Um, what do you start with? You know, who, who are you and what are you most passionate about? Um, I think that's always really interesting. For a night like tonight, when we're talking about pathways to power and we're talking about success, I think a great place to start is identifying what does power look like for us? What does success look like for us? Holly, what do you think? 
Great question, and two really big questions. Uh, and I think uh, power I probably have a, a more general definition of, whereas one of the most profound things that's probably happened on my own journey is actually understanding how important it is you individualize this notion of success for yourself. Mm. I think I spent a long time uh, chasing after, and, and in particularly at points in my career where I had a fork in the road and wasn't sure which way to go, I found that quite often when I was in a, a tension between two pathways, it was because uh, the people that were talking to me around what I should do were projecting a definition of success onto me as opposed to me actually being able to articulate uh, and go, no, that's the pathway and, and this is the filter that I'm putting over that. So for me, power is, is about the ability to, I guess, influence others and to influence a course of events. And I guess that the power that I resonate with is where that's done through trust, where that's done through gaining, uh, I guess, people's faith in, um, the, in your ability to articulate on their behalf. And, and therefore, I guess you build a movement and you build that, that platform that comes from a genuine place of seeking to give rise to a positive outcome. And for me, I'm particularly passionate around power it, resonating with a number of the people on the panel around how it is we improve the lives of those less fortunate in our community and give voice to people who don't have an adequate one within our current power structures. Um, to, to take that piece on success a little bit further, um, an exercise I did, one of my mentors called me over at a, a point where I was in a real tension between where to go and she said, I want you to put your arm out and say to me, say out loud, I'm comfortable with success. She proceeded to push my arm straight down. So I was holding it out like that and she pushed it straight down. She said, I want you to say I'm comfortable with failure. I put my arm out and I said that and when she pushed, it stayed up. And that scared the life out of me because there was no part of me that was okay with what had just happened. And she said, I, I understand that. You've got to go and unpack what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I went and took myself on a, what I call a self-date to continue the dating theme. Mm -hmm. And I sat down at a cafe and I put uh, 60 seconds on the clock and I wrote my no holds barred definition of success. Because I think it's so easy to not let ourselves actually say things out loud that we truly want because we feel shame or guilt or we're so often concerned about putting others first as opposed to thinking about what it is that truly makes our heart sing and we want to realise. And when I wrote that down, it was really clarifying because it ultimately boiled down to, to four pillars of success. It was about having the ability to um, spend quality time with the people I love and care about and do everything I can to help support them in what they're doing. It was about having the privilege of getting to choose the work that I do and the people I work with and having the privilege of doing work that will outlive me. Uh, and finally, it was about having the opportunity to grow, be challenged and learn at the pace that I wanted to. And when I got clear on that definition of success, it helped clarify all the decisions I made from that point. Because when I put that as the filter over the opportunities that were in front of me, you know, it made the pathways really clear. So if you haven't tried, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, sitting down and trying to define that for myself. Mm -hmm. That and your values are probably the two most clarifying exercises you can do in your life. Um, but I can't encourage you enough. If, if you haven't sat down and taken that self-date, find a Canberra cafe and go do it. <laughs> um, Stephanie, what does power look like for you? So Holly's used one of the words, um, and that's influence. And I think the other thing for me is impact. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when I was thinking about this whole concept of power, it reminded me when I was a graduate, in fact, um, of one of the senior men in the organisation commenting on how ambitious I was. And like I was 21 years old, I didn't know what power or success or anything felt like. I was actually still getting pissed and falling off trams on St Kilda Road. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that that was a really dirty word, mm. ambitious, because yeah. to me it meant crawling over people, yeah. um, self-centred, etc. And it was only many, many years later that I actually got comfortable with this concept of, um, of being ambitious um, and of being able to articulate that and be confident in saying it. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the things that that really strikes me is it never it never becomes easy mm. so I've just been going through this process um, where the secretaries of the public service have decided to do a talent council and they've got 10 people on a pilot and they're assessing each of us it's really really tough process and I'm in the room with these two high-powered folks from Egon Zender and they said to me so What's your aspiration? What do, you, what do you want to be? And I struggled to actually say, I want to be a secretary. And I thought, because I'm scared that I might not be. And if I say it out loud, then everyone will think 
look, you weren't, you know, you had an aspiration that you couldn't fulfill. And having got through that and feeling great about myself, they said, which departments do you want to lead? And I'm thinking, God, you know, <laughs> give me a break here. Um, and then well, why do you think you can do that? And, and it's sort of, I find that both reassuring and challenging at the same mm. time, because you want to believe that one day you'll make it, you know, that you'll be this perfectly self-contained, assured um, uh, superwoman. And the reality is you never are. And I don't think it matters how high you go. There's always, there's always going to be the need to think, what do I really, what do I really aspire for now? What do I think I can achieve? Mm. And, and why do I want to do that? And so I go back to the what is power to me. Mm. It's the ability to make a bigger impact on the system, to have more influence um, for good. Mm. Well, that. Yeah, I agree. Jennifer, do you think that power and success look different at different milestones and different stages throughout your life and throughout your career? Absolutely. Power and success are very different things. Mm. And um, I should say that I want to be a nun, so I have absolutely no drunk stories. Um, <laughs> so uh, you won't get one of those from me, unfortunately. Um, power and success are very, very different things, and they're often very, very confused. And Power without purpose is position. Mm. And it is empty, vacuous, and meaningless. And lots of people get very confused about that. Mm. So, you know, I think if you want to really make an impact, you've got to have a sense of purpose. And when you're uh, striving for position, you've got to be really clear about the impact and influence and the things you want to change. The only job I have ever really sought in my life, and none of us have a path that goes the way you expected, was to be the head of the housing department. Because mm. I grew up in public housing and I absolutely wanted to change the culture that had seen my family treated like second class citizens. And I was absolutely determined to join that department and become the head of it. Mm. And luckily was able to do that. So I think when you think about power, you've got to think about what you want to do with it, mm. why you want to do that who you need to surround yourself mm. to actually achieve that. Because if you don't, you'll be a position watcher and you'll be very ineffective. Yes. Mm. Roseanne, what about you? What does power and success look like for you? Well, I agree. I, I think uh, the, the idea of power and success are two very different things. Mm. But then when we think about power, I think, you know, like if you sat here for a moment and said, okay, we're using this word power a lot today. Mm. Uh, when you think, who is the first person that comes to mind when you think about power? And you know, is it bad if I say Oprah? <laughs> <laughs> I do love Oprah. You'll hear me referring to Oprah a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, or it could be Trump. Mm -hmm. Or it could be Turnbull. Yeah. Uh, yeah. These are these are people that you may want to or not want to, to be like mm. and uh, and they they are you know perceived as having this ultimate ultimate power, power. Uh, and and then of course with with that goes well you know do I and, and this is this is a challenge for me so I, I actually think I, I feel uncomfortable with the word power mm. and um, I feel uncomfortable with ever considering myself as being a person of power which is quite ridiculous mm. Because here we are, we are talking about empowerment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about you know, this question about when, it, when, when did I feel most powerful? And again, I, I, the word again, I just feel uncomfortable, but I actually thought that the, the first thing that came to mind was when I've seen people run as a result of something of inspiration being lit in them. That to me has been the moment when I have felt most powerful. You know, be it um, in a one-to-one -one conversation or in a, a group setting, for me that that have, they have been the moments when I've just felt mm. uh, power. So, uh, do I do I want to think of power in particular in in this context as something that I'm chasing? No, um, I think the word influence and impact and and difference and and something bigger than yourself. Mm. Uh, and I think that is, you know, the purpose that we want to strive for. And I, I just absolutely love the, the views that, that you're putting forward around this word that I'm uncomfortable with. Mm. 
Why do you think you're uncomfortable with it? I think that that's an interesting thing. Well, and I, and I wonder whether it's a part of it is, is because it is a word that has been over-masculinised. Over, yes. So it is a word that is so typically associated with... With a guy. A guy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the Marvel comics. Mm -hmm. Real yes. Wonder Woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good movie. Uh, it's, it's, it's movies that we've mm. grown up with. It's the cartoons that I watched when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was even the positioning of my grandfather to my grandmother at the, the table. Mm. You know, the, this has been power. Yeah. So how do we how do we adjust it so actually power is is mm. is you know being righted mm -hmm. uh, in our own minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that beautiful women like you sit up on a stage like this and go, heck yeah, I'm powerful. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So is that what Oprah does? Oh, <laughs> Oprah tells me to lean into life. I do love Oprah. <laughs> and I do lean into opportunities. Um, so let's, and I love that, you know, mm. that moment that you felt most powerful. Let's mind that, ladies. Take us to a moment, a time, an action where you can identify that you had made a difference or that you might feel powerful. Jennifer. Uh, when I was uh, running the Department of Housing, um, we had a lot of issues. I don't know if people know Waterloo in Sydney, uh, the, the big towers in uh, near Redfern there, and and we had some huge issues, fires. We had a lot of people killed and murdered on the estate, and the residents really wanted intercoms and locks and security. And and I remember um, all of the uh, guys in the department who who like it can't happen it can't possibly happen you can't do it you can't agree to this um we can't do it blah 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 blah. and then i just thought bugger it and i rang the minister myself i mean i obviously knew him pretty well but and i said i need two million dollars to put intercom systems and fences wow. uh around these buildings so that people can feel secure this this was a big issue it was running in the media all the time and I want to set up a tenants group. I want to give them a coffee shop. I want to do, he said, this is Robert Webster, still a good friend of mine. He said, just do it. And uh, you know, whenever I drive past that housing estate and I see kids playing behind fences and you know, people were using the intercom systems, probably they're not working now, but anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, I, you just thought, I, I was so proud of that. I was so proud that I just got on the phone, I w when I say I was running the Department of Housing, I was running a REACH and I wasn't the head of the ha department by then. And I just thought, no, I am going to exercise mm -hmm. my power to basically push back at all these people who were telling me it couldn't be done, you couldn't do it, you'll never get the money, it'll never happen, and it got done. Mm -hmm. And it solved so many problems for people, but, and it made their lives a lot better. Mm. Beautiful, that is a powerful moment. Remind me to call you when I need a bank loan. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, a moment for you that you felt strong? I was so hoping you wouldn't come to me next. Um, I almost never feel powerful. Mm. And so it's not, a, it's not something that sits really comfortable, comfortably with me. Mm. But I was thinking about Jennifer's example and thinking about the things that have given me most joy and fulfillment yep. um, that mm -hmm. I've felt that in some way I've been able to enable um, or make happen and it's actually a whole bunch of images uh, that come to mind uh, of, s of seeing the staff that I've been working with um, deliver something that they're passionate about and feel great about themselves and what they've done. Um, and, and these sound like such little examples, but um, we've been trying to change the way the public service thinks about itself and acts. And so my folks have been doing things like running hackathons and to see them in a room with a hundred people who are all motivated and excited and it's their thing and they feel like they're changing the world are the moments when I just feel this deep, intense joy and satisfaction. 
Mm-hmm. I love, love that. that. Holly, what's that moment for you? Or it's probably a range of moments, but a moment that comes to your mind. Yeah, to take it in a a different trajectory, because if we were Chatham House, I could tell you a few G20 stories about current ministers and and various people where both powerless and and powerful, you know, in in the same span of time almost. But what's interesting to me is a moment where I I realise the power that each and every one of us have in, in the example that we set, often when we're completely unconscious that we're having that sort of impact. Um, I did a really interesting challenge in 2015 with my best friend and we decided to do uh, what we call Fear Factor 15. So 365 days of doing something we were afraid of. And uh, one thing that was almost the sum total of probably 50 of the Fear Factors of that year was I decided 100 days out from an Ironman um, to sign up at a time when I couldn't have run 10Ks and probably hadn't been on a bike in about eight years. And see if I could do this 3.8k swim, 180k cycle, and then 42k run. Oh my god! Um, very irrational decision-making process in here. Uh, there was a moment uh, on the bike course of that race uh, where I was at the about the 88k mark. There were 35k headwinds that day that we were riding into, and I swear to you, I could have gotten off my bike and walked faster than I felt like I was riding at that point. <laughs> Uh, and my body is screaming at me and, and your head's sort of going, are you joking? We've got to do a whole other lap of this bike course and then we've got to go run 42Ks. Like yeah. what <laughs> nutbag signed us up for this thing? Um, but if you know marathons and you know uh, triathlons or anything of that nature, you'll know that wonderful salt of the earth human beings line the streets all day with signs, cheering people on, motivating you, all those sorts of things. And as I was riding into to Bustleton in, in WA to, to turn around the turn cone and go back out, there was this mum that was sitting on the front lawn with her two daughters. One of them looked about 13, one of them looked about 10. And as I rode past, the little one of the two yelled out, Mum, Mum, look, it's a girl just like me. Oh, my God. Oh, awesome. oh my God. I can't even tell. I get goosebumps every time I talk about it. I can't even tell you in that moment the switch that flicked. Mm-hmm. And that realisation for me that I hadn't been conscious of at any point on the journey uh, till that moment of, wow, that there was an ability for a young girl to see something in that that made her think she could do something. And even though my body screamed for the remainder of that race, there was no way in hell that I was not going to cross that finishing line. And fortunately, at 13 hours and 53 minutes, I did. Um, But that moment for me was just such a powerful reminder of the example that we set every day when we push ourselves outside our comfort zone, when we uh, make time for other people, just by doing what we do and giving our absolute best, the the ripple effect that can create. And every time, it's similar to your point, every time I hear stories of that, how you've managed to reach someone, touch someone, make them believe they could do something bigger than they might have thought previously, that that for me is is the moment I feel most powerful. Yeah, I love that. Have you ever done an Iron Man again? I did actually. I drunk the Kool-Aid a little bit. So I decided <laughs> to, to see if I could do it, if I'd actually trained properly. It was a bit of a hack job at 100 days out. Sounds it, pretty good to me. Yeah, um, and uh, I actually managed a top 10 finish last August uh, racing oh. in the United States, which was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, mate. So last place to getting slightly better. It was good. Good girl. Incredible. Roseanne? Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, just building on the, the, the sports theme, um, my husband's a, a runner and, uh, in fact, last year he, um, he completed the North Pole Marathon. Whoa. Uh, pretty incredible, but <laughs> in particular, more than that, we had the absolute privilege of um, him being there with Rob DeCostella and uh, Adrian Dodson Shaw, who was the first ever Indigenous man to go to the North Pole and let alone finish a marathon there. Uh, it was just a, a really remarkable experience and, and uh, an empowering experience in our family. Uh, but I was just reflecting on, on you know, the, the words you were using in describing you know, the running and, mm. uh, and that moment. When I hear my husband talking to my, my son about uh, his runs, mm. he's using words like, you're a machine. Uh, don't you feel powerful when you're out there? Your, your body is doing this. Yeah, it, you know, words that are actually quite strong mm. and, and not emotional. And not emotional. Mm. And yet, where we're using words about influence and, and seeing people flicking the switch. And I, I, I really wonder whether or not we will ever come together in thinking about these these two concepts around it. Will mm. we actually see see the 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 comfort, our comfort, with mm-hmm. with those words? Will we ever embrace it or are we always going to sit with 
the emotional. Yep. Mm. Uh, because I, I think with this, we, we have to make room for people to be who they are and who they want to be and encourage them to start using words that are actually reflective of them. And Holly, just hearing you using words that are reflective of you, yes, you've got this great you know, stuff about flicking the switch in people and seeing that inspiration at the same time as using those, those strong, confident, powerful words. Uh, I, think, I think we have to get better at that. Mm. I really do. Uh, but you know, to this point about um, when have I actually felt that moment, it was actually um, also the moment when I felt most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So the moment for me was, I use a lot of story around my family, but when uh, my stepdaughter Jessica uh, came to me because she was uh, practicing for a, uh, an interview um, for a grad position with the Bureau of Statistics. And she came into the bedroom, Rose, <coughs> I've been you know, practicing, and she's very thorough, I've been practicing what I should say in this interview. And I've decided on the answer to the question if they asked me, uh, who is my role model? And she said, I'm going to say it's you. Mm. Oh, of course I was a mess. Yeah, <laughs> I would have been too. <laughs> uh, but but you know, this, this responsibility we have, and there, there, mm. you know, she had seen me day in, day out, the struggles, of, with uh, with with uh, work, the, the you know the 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 um, trying to be my best when I could, try to cook food and I'm allowed to cook, <laughs> uh, you know, trying to keep up with the washing. She had seen all those moments, and yet she was still able to call that out. Mm. And so, if I come back to this point about we have to be authentic, we have to use words that are real to us, mm. and you have to find your own words to describe your own success. You know, just like that 60 minute, 60 second challenge. You know, mm -hmm. what is it to mm -hmm. you? Because that's when you're going to hit your power switch. Mm -hmm. And sort of zoning other people out to sometimes when they're sucking that power from you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that might be a nice way to now transition into what might be the trickiest part of tonight. And that is putting your hand on your heart and talking about that moment that you felt powerless. Mm -hmm a moment that you can still look back on and thought, God, I felt crap there. Mm. Do you want to start again, Rose? Oh, heavens, that's too many. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I've had one. I had one only just recently that made me feel really crappy. We're going through it. Hopefully this doesn't leave the room on. <laughs> Who cares if it does? Um, <laughs> I, I'm basically, in, in one of the, my roles, I'm going through a bit of a, a transition at the moment and I'm getting a new co-host um, for my breakfast show. And um, I felt like the bachelorette um, <laughs> over the last month or so, meeting all of these different men and having to demo with them. And sort of when it got to the end few, my management team brought me in and sort of said, you know, what do you think? Who do you think? And I could feedback on you know the strengths or the opportunities for you know each of what would be the sound of the show and um an all male management team mind you um and they said oh thanks for your feedback um it's, it's actually been really hard i'm um, trying to find a really talented anchor male anchor you know, if we were if we were replacing you, like God, there's there's hundreds, but um, <laughs> it's actually been quite hard. And so I I had to take a moment where, and you know, obviously my mindset is, um, I'm a journalist by trade. I've sort of um, worked my way up into this hosting role, something that is so dear to me and shining a light on um, different you know stories everybody's got a story and everybody deserves to have that story told and driving out to your house with icy cold cans of coke sure i get that that's probably part of my role on commercial radio as well but yeah to sit with them and actually say you know what guys in this moment if you don't appreciate what i'm bringing to this role um, and to this show, let's talk about my exit strategy. Should have seen their faces. And, and I actually realized in that moment that they were talking to me with words and a tone that they didn't even register yeah. would be offensive. Mm -hmm. And I found that the most interesting thing. And you have those moments where you go, 
don't get emotional, mm. don't get teary, you know, talk about um, your skill set and what you feel like you bring to the role and why you do mm. feel like there wouldn't be hundreds of other people who could do the same thing. <laughs> but also identify that, you know, I don't want to be anywhere that doesn't value me. You know, if you don't get it, if we're not on the same page, like let's, let's tip our hats and go in separate directions now. So they sent me a bunch of flowers the next day. So. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I think the key note for me was that they didn't realise. Mm. They were talking to me with a language and a, and a perspective um, that I was maybe one of the boys or I don't know, but they, they didn't realise. And I, I had to dig into my power source then and actually think, okay, well, in this moment, what's, what's best for me and, and, and move forward from there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, when we think about our power, you've got to think about what's your power base. Uh, and you know what's what's kind of driving your ability to succeed in a moment, and driving uh, the the things that actually enable you to be the best that you can be. And uh, one of the things I will say is I think you know, in Canberra we're really lucky to be able to have networks and relationships that we have. And you know this is you know one of the reasons why I think the, this. Uh, this organisation is so incredible is that we're actually helping t to help women build their power base. Mm. Uh, but I think to times in my career where I've actually felt not powerful and one that comes to mind was when we we uh, picked up and left and went to London because that's what you do and of course you do it um, just as the GAF GFC hits and of course you land in London as the stock market is at its most lowest don't you oh and you take a family good time yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, cracking, cracking <laughs> decision and uh, and I had to start from scratch so uh, the job that I had lined up unfortunately fell through and so I had to start from scratch in London, a big scary city, mm. without the relationships that I had lent on through my career to that point, uh, and needing to you know, try and translate my experience into that market. Mm. Uh, and that was, that was a real challenge. <laughs> uh, I actually kept a log of all the jobs that I applied for and the conversations that I had with people. Uh, and, and you know, turning up to, to the interview that ultimately I was really fortunate to, to be successful with, uh, being in a room full of people who I thought were amazing, you know, a bit like sitting on this stage with these incredible women, I, I, I thought I have no right to be in this room. Mm. You know, these are people who have got experience in financial markets or you know, that actually understand what it's like to work in this big scary city called London. Uh, and uh, there was I, this, kid from Canberra, where's mm -hmm. Canberra, uh, trying to, to get a job there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a really amazing experience because then I actually dug into, okay, you know, what could I do? Well, I could have a conversation with people. Mm -hmm. And I made some great friends yeah. uh, who are still friends today from that interview day. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, finished that, that job interview and went home. Uh, said to my husband, oh golly, let's, you know, thank goodness that's over, where's the bottle of wine, let's go get some strawberries. Mm -hmm. And the phone rang. And uh, the, the conversation went along the lines of, uh, so how do you think, think it went? Oh, you know, great conversation, thanks very much. Uh, you got the job. And <laughs> of course, you know, this chick from Canberra. Fair dinkum. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. What an idiot. Um, <laughs> Not at all. But, but uh, yeah. so, so I think, you know, I, 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 I really do reflect back on that and thinking, well, I, in that moment when I walked into that room and felt really powerless, mm -hmm. I really had to dig deep to even hold my head high, mm. to be even to, able to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yet what came from that was, in fact, what I brought into that, which was, you know, I, I made some great friends in that room. Mm -hmm. And I had a really fantastic conversation. That's what I bring. Yeah. So, you know, where do you draw your power mm. from? What's your power base? Because sometimes what you traditionally might think your power base is, may not be. Yeah. You made lemonade. Mm. Mm. Jennifer, a time for you that you felt powerless? <clears throat> yeah, this is a very personal story. It was a long time ago. So I don't know if any of you remember a guy called Donald Horn. 
wrote an incredibly famous book called The Lucky Country. He was my supervisor at university and he desperately wanted me to be, um, to go into the diplomatic service. And he'd organised all these interviews for me and he said, uh, you, uh, you need to get your birth certificate, yada, 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 yada. So uh, I said to my mother, I want my birth certificate and she got very distressed and uh, anyway, cut a long story short, something I didn't know, that my parents weren't married. And I went back to him and said, look, you know, this is the situation. He said, forget it, forget it. You can never join the diplomatic service if you're from that family background. So I'm going back in a, I'm showing my age now. Wow. And it was the most disempowering, humiliating mm. thing because there was nothing I could control in any of that. It was something I had never had any control over. My mother was very embarrassed and humiliated about it. And years later, he said to me, you know, it was terrible advice I gave you. You could have gone in. Uh, you would have overcome it. I'm not sure my life would have been better or worse as a result of it. But I remember it uh, really clearly as just this, there was nothing I can do to change the circumstances of my family. Nothing. There's absolutely no power. But what it did teach me, and when he and I had a conversation many years later, was never let other people define what your success looks like. Yeah. Never let other people kind of constrain your ambition. And in hindsight, I wish I just kind of applied and sort of uh, checked out what, what happened. But, you know, like, you've got to sort of kind of bounce back from those things. Mm. And so he and I, I mean, he, we remained good friends until he died. We then sat down and came up with another career plan and, you know, it hasn't been all that bad. But, um, <laughs> but, but you know, you've got to get back on the horse. But yeah. I remember it was just utter humiliation, mm -hmm. utter humiliation. And it is hard. Like, people do say mm -hmm. that. You'll be right. Brush yourself off. Get back on the horse. That's hard. It is hard. And sometimes it, I, I think it takes a lot of power and a lot of strength to give yourself time. To allow mm. yourself to grieve a little bit after little moments like that and then sort of shake yourself off. Stephanie, a moment for you that you felt powerless? So, there's actually three quick moments um, in the last few years since I um, became a Deputy Secretary. The first was not long after I was promoted and I was in a completely new world, different department, no contacts, no knowledge. Secretary who promoted me left and new, a new one came. And within a couple of months, it was clear that he didn't value me at all. And he started, I think just one day, called me in and said, oh, have you noticed that um, they're advertising deputy secretary jobs back in your old department? <laughs> and, <laughs> so, you know, you, have, you think, am I really hearing this? Yeah. Um, yeah. And this can't be right. Maybe that's not what he really meant. Mm. And you just so wish people would be honest with you and mm. say, I don't rate you. Could you leave? Yeah. Leaving you. Yeah. It was a pretty tough couple of years. I went to um, Department of Regional Australia. I had a minister who was one of the toughest blokes I've ever worked for and did some special lines in public humiliation. And remember at one meeting that I'd organised with all these regional big wigs and... Uh, he was cross with me for something and he did the whole public humiliation thing and it happened over the dinner and it happened again the next day. By the time I got back to work in Canberra, I was just a mess. Mm. One of my staff said to me, how did it go? And I just dissolved <laughs> in tears. And as I was saying, you know, if I just hadn't used the expression white paper, he wouldn't have been so angry. And my gorgeous Simon said to me, listen to you, if I hadn't burnt the toast, he wouldn't have beaten the crap out of me, you know. Mm. And then the third little moment was at the end of that period, the department folded up. Um, uh, and as the music stopped, I didn't have a job. There was, the, the, all my staff had gone in different ways mm. and there was no one there. And I had to pick up the telephone and start calling secretaries and saying, hi, it's Stephanie here. So each of those sort of moments <coughs> was extraordinarily demoralizing, draining of confidence, etc., mm. etc. And one of the things that I've had to learn the hard way is not to take my sense of worth from what other people mm. think of me. And this is a work in progress. I would, I would not uh, say that I've got this gardened. 
Mm. But, you know, the intellectual bit of me was saying, you're still the same person who did a fabulous job in your last job, mm. but it just didn't feel like that mm. in those moments. <laughs> and so, you know, if there was one, one thing that I could, could leave with people, it would be, however it is, find the way, find whatever it takes to believe in yourself despite what's happening in the world around you. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Holly? I'm just blown away by the, the realness of the stories tonight. Like, thank you everyone for just opening up like that. Uh, I think for me, uh, probably, I, I could tell you a million stories about failures and mistakes and, and stuff that's happened professionally, but without a question, the thing that's been the hardest for me personally was getting diagnosed with depression in 2013. That was a label that I found really hard to wrap my head around. I remember sitting in so my doctor's office and she was going through this checklist and she said, do you know what you've just answered yes to a checklist for? And I said, no, and she said, depression. I'm sitting there bawling. Like I couldn't stop crying, you know, in, in this period at all. And, and I said, but I'm Tigger. Like, what do, you, what do you mean? That was literally my response. You know, I'm happy, I'm bubbly. Like, mm. how, how can that be something that, that's happening to me? Um, and I really struggled with it because I grew up in a household where um, you just got on. You didn't, you didn't show emotions, you, you just expected to push through. And I, mm. I really found it difficult to wrap my head around what I perceived as weakness. I would never project that onto anyone else, but I found that really difficult to wrap, because I, I should have just been able to get on and go with it. Why couldn't I stop crying? Why couldn't I just do it in the way that I had been able to previously? Um, and I look back now and it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, because there was so many mindsets I needed to reframe. There were so many habits I needed to positively reshape. Mm. Uh, it was an incredible opportunity to be able to relay the foundations for the way I was going about doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the reason, you know, it looks like a completely irrational decision when I talk about the Ironman out of context, but it was the reason I chose to sign up for an Ironman. Mm. Because for me, there was a statement I needed to make to myself and I needed to make to, probably to the community because I still think it's unfortunately incredibly stigmatized to talk about mental health, even though we know one in four Australians now on current data is yeah. battling some kind of mental health, uh, depression, anxiety, the like. Um, you know, for me, it was, I'm gonna find that the toughest mental and physical challenge I can find, and in a healthy way, I'm gonna do it with the coping skills, the strategies, the new techniques, everything I've developed, I'm gonna prove to myself, and I'm gonna prove to, to anyone out there who might be going through something similar that even if this is part of your story, it doesn't need to define you. Mm -hmm. And it sure as hell doesn't mean that there's anything you can't do out there. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, that, that moment, though I still, I can remember vividly everything that happened that day, even though for large chunks of that period of time, I actually can't remember at all. Um, that was definitely for me the moment I felt most powerless. How do you feel today? I feel in incredibly I strong. Like, I, I mean, one of the things I look back at I feel very grateful and I don't mean to in any way make light of anyone who might be in this. I had a very quick recovery out of depression, which I think is in part just the, the way that I go about tackling things when I need to tackle it and also how wonderful the support crew that I had around me were and the fact that I, I did choose to really invest the time in making sure I did it right this time and I laid foundations in, in, a, in a really healthy and sustainable way. So I can say hand on heart that um, I can tell you the day that I came out in 2014 of, of that difficult period, and I can tell you that I haven't looked back since, um, which I'm probably, from a personal standpoint, if you ask me the thing I was most personally proud of, it'd be that. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, honey. Thanks. Well done. More power to you. Um, I am going to ask these ladies for a bit of a takeaway, you know. Um, Oprah calls it her aha moment. But um, a takeaway, you know, for you guys, something one thing to focus on, you know, as you get into your cars and drive away. Um, but before we get there, I want to open up the floor. Um, ladies, thank you very much. I do have a, a really key question. Um, I see a lot of ladies get into leadership ranks in organisations and um, unfortunately we do have a lot of male dominated um, industries and you get to a point where you just go, I just can't be bothered. Like it's just, it's so silly, it's so tough. What advice do you give um, to girls like us <laughs> that you do? You kind of get up in the morning and go, I just don't want to do this anymore. What's, what's the best advice to, to get us out of bed and keep us going every day? I love that. Jennifer, go for <clears throat> it. Well, um, I mean, organisations have to do something. We can come back to that. What do you have to do? You have to be really good at stuff. And you may not like me saying that. 
but the reality is that uh, you do. And if I think about the things that kind of propelled my career, it was things like taking a risk, moving. So, uh, you know, I moved three or four times, did different jobs in different locations, mm. taking the hardest project that was imaginable to mankind and doing it unbelievably well. And then you became famous for something. Mm. And then people could not look the other way when they were thinking about you for a job. And yet it is frustrating and it's incredibly hard, but no one is going to fix that problem for you mm. other than you. And, and my concern is, is that, you, you know, that's not going to change without you changing it. So you can either kind of change your ambition, in which case you're just going to have a life of frustration, mm. or you can say, I am going to push into that very hard. Second kind of bit of advice is you have got to collaborate and find mentors and mm -hmm. champions, and they will not always be women. So if I think about the three best partnerships I had, two of them were with, were with men. And, and they would, not in this kind of false mentoring way, which I think is, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> you know where, and I know, I know that we're sitting in a building where there's probably a whole program of <laughs> mentoring. And, so I'm not saying those things, but, but natural mentors are always more powerful for you. And you have got to surround yourself with people mm. Who, who are going to help you. Not people who are going to get you the next job you've got your eye on, but people who are going to help you kind of think about what you want to do and give you the hard advice, but also the people who are actually going to stand up for you uh, when, when things go wrong. So that would be my kind of take on that. But, and no one likes to hear that advice, to do, something, to do something really hard, to become famous at something, to push through the sort of stuff that Stephanie had to put up mm. with. But you have to. Because it will not get done around you, and you, you know, it, the blokes are no res disrespect. <laughs> mo mo <laughs> most of the, you know, it's, it's the minister's nail. point is absolutely right. Uh, you know, guys have never had this issue. They they just say, yeah, I can do that. And of course, they can't. Overwhelmed. <laughs> and, it, you know, I, so I used to, when I was a departmental head, you know, these guys would be working back till nine o'clock at night, and they'd go, oh, I was working till nine at night last night. And you'd, and you'd say to yourself, well, not a single thing was produced. <laughs> you know, nine o'clock shift, and the women who had kids would leave at five, heaps of stuff would be on your desk for them to sign. Yeah. And you knew what they were doing was avoiding having to be home when the kids were getting fed. So, you know, you've got to just accept that there is a structural unfairness that we have to fix, mm. but you can't turn it into a kind of victim thing. Mm. I like that. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I've got one really quick thing to add. Oh, and good. That's if, you, if you're really clear about what you want, then it helps you power through yep. those mm -hmm. moments. Yep. So, you know, I wake up a lot of times thinking, today feels too hard, mm -hmm. but I'm passionate about mm -hmm. what I'm doing and I really want to do it. And so I think, well, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. Do you want to stay home and garden? No, <laughs> so just get up, girl. Yeah. Try a bit harder and power through that. Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, one of the themes that you've clearly heard. I think, well, I've heard in in the stories is about uh, purpose mm -hmm. and having a purpose beyond yourself uh, that you can kind of attach. That okay, I'm gonna just pull up my socks and get out the door. Uh, you know, for some people, it's it's that I need to put food on the table and so I'm going out to provide. Mm. Uh, and for others, it's about you know, changing the world. Mm. Whatever your purpose is uh, mm. outside of yourself, being focused on that. And to be honest, there is also a bit of, uh, you know, harden up buttercup. Uh, and you know, like these ladies, there are days when I just, yep, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do this. Um, but there has to be a point at which you say, actually, I will do this because I have a responsibility and my responsibility is to the purpose, whatever that might be for yourself. For me, um, coming through the ranks here in PwC, uh, I was really privileged to be one of the first female partners promoted from our ranks uh, here in Canberra and uh, a real privilege. But for me, it was about 
um, pushing through because I really want to make way for more and more women to be sitting at that partnership mm -hmm. table with me, for being able to, to encourage more women to be driving through and making the difference and finding their own purpose and pathway. Whatever that is for you, you have to attach yourself to it. Can I add one other thing quickly? It's piggybacking a bit on what Jennifer said. I think mentors are so, so important, but the other thing I'd say is find your tribe. Mm. Find the other yep. women, at, or men for that matter, who are in similar situations of trying to lead change in a challenging cultural environment and band together. You know, have those be the people and you circuit break for each other and you get together and you share the war stories. And I remember Anna Bly saying once, you know, um, she, she was talking about being Premier of Queensland and sort of saying people kept talking to me after uh, the election where she came out of office and all those sorts of things, um, talking about the scars and talking about the wounds and, and focusing on, on the difficulty and the challenge and the struggle and the aftermath. And she said, you know, I felt like I'd smashed through a wall and everyone was asking me to look at my grazes and my cuts and my bruises. And I'm going, hold on, turn around and look at the hole I just made in the wall. Yeah, and and awesome. you need people with that sort of mentality, I think, yeah. to wrap around and, and form a tribe. And, and I couldn't encourage, and hopefully you'll find them in the room tonight. I mean, it's yeah. a great collection of like-minded people where you might be able to start those sorts of conversations and those sorts of gatherings um, out of people that you connect with here. Talking about power and women having power, if we assume that we all have some kind of power and that we aspire to have more power or influence, what would you say is the biggest responsibility with, or who are you accountable to with having power, whatever form it might take? It's a great question. It is yourself. a fantastic. Yeah, yourself. I was going to say yourself too. Absolutely, you're accountable to yourself. Can I add one other thing on that? We're accountable to the next generation. Yeah. And I think about that a lot. Uh, I think about how important it is that we make sure at whatever point, sort of as custodians, we pass things over that it's in a better situation. And I don't mm. think we can say that right now. I really don't. I look at the state of the world and go, we've got a lot of work to do to change the game around for the next generation. So I agree absolutely from that personal integrity standpoint of, you know, have I lived my values? Have I done what I promised myself I was going to do in the manner I promised myself I'd do it? But also that accountability of the next generation. Just to pick up on Holly's point about values though, because this is my thing about position versus purpose. If you're very clear about your values, then you can be accountable to yourself. Uh, if you're accountable to yourself for your CV, that, that you, you are not going to be really accountable. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a real clear sense of purpose and you've got a real clear sense of a set of values that are around integrity, then that self-accountability is hugely yeah. important. Uh, but it won't work if you haven't done that thinking about what do I stand for? Mm -hmm. What do I believe in? Because it does become a kind of, I've ticked that off, I've ticked that off, I've mm -hmm. ticked that off. Hi. Hi, I am one of these, um, uh, questions that I always think about um, nowadays. I, you know, go in different groups and I socialize and I can see that there is more advancement. We have Julie Gillard that was Prime Minister and we have a lot of people such as yourself in entertainment, PwC, government and change that are really um, enforcing that you are the images. My question is put simply, are there areas in your um, places, whether it's government or entertainment, where you feel like there is a lack of women in that diversity and there should be more change to make it better? Because I can see in countries where there are more gender inclusion, like in Scandinavian countries, Norway, Switzerland, Denmark, where they address these issues and life is better for them, but they're not as you know westernized as most countries. Mm. Put simply, do you think there should be a change in a particular area in your area or a different area that can make Australia to be gender equal and therefore, you know, leader in, you know, um, uh, women's rights? I don't know where I'm going to end it, but I hope, <laughs> hope you kind of go along those lines. Yeah. Rose, what do you think? So I, uh, I'd like to expand that more broadly to just be inclusion. Uh, you, we, I think every, everywhere we look, there is, there is room for us to do better to make sure that there is um, at least equal for, for people to achieve the potential that they have. I think about, say, say the welfare uh, sector and, and in particular the, the intergenerational 
uh, welfare dependence. Mm -hmm. you, know, you think about the 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 need to do something there. Uh, you think about the even um, and and I don't know if this is true. Some maybe someone in the room can confirm this, but I heard that um, it, it may be that. Uh, homosexual men are not able to give blood. Can anyone That's confirm correct. that? That's correct. Really? How's that for equality? Mm. Yeah, it's extraordinary. So there are, there, are, there are things that we need to do as a society to give equal opportunity for people to be able to contribute the way that is right for them. Mm. And I think all of our, our sectors uh, kudos to the public service. I actually mm. think they are standout, um, and round of applause for them. They are truly standout. Uh, and but they started this journey what 20, 20 years ago, Stephanie. Mm. Nineteen sixty-six. Yeah. And 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 the result is there in in their senior ranks. Truly fantastic, mm. and, and obviously getting better too. Uh, and I think that is a great example for us. And I think about our firm and the, 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 the diversity that we want in our firm because we need to represent society. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to, to support society in solving tough problems. Well, the way we've got to do that is actually to have people who are, who are representative of society, be it uh, in, in uh, gender, in, uh, in sexual preference, in ability, in culture in particular, yeah, these are the things that we've got to be better at. Okay. Well, I obviously represent the business community and we've got a lot of work to do here. Mm. Uh, and how do we do it? Well, we have to take a leaf out of the public services book because they've done recruitment. Well, certainly when things turned around, Stephanie might have a different view of things like, you know, who was on a panel? How was a job described? How are leadership attributes? Forcing the panel to actually kind of complete some kind of justification of the person that they had appointed so it wasn't a sort of shoulder tapping mm. exercise uh, and I you know the business council is pushing hard into this about what is it about the recruitment onboarding stuff because if you don't do that you can't get the pipeline which of course mm. is the big problem it's the problem no doubt in partnerships when I was a partner at KPMG you know we had this target for 25 percent of women of the partners to be women but of course the real hard work was around the pipeline and actually giving people, getting people into the pipeline. Uh, and then, you know, from that, I think we've got to do a tremendous amount of work about recruitment on boards, changing attitudes, making things merit and performance based. You know, there was a survey of company chairmen done a while ago and, you know, they were asked why they didn't appoint women and things like, you know, well, they talk too much, um, they won't get the financials. Uh, you, you could not believe that survey when you heard it played back, you just thought, Okay, I'm obviously in a parallel universe again. Um, <laughs> but, again. you know, there's, so there's huge amount of work to do in business yeah. on this. And people are trying to face into it and, and come to terms with it. But I think there's always that sort of, we'll make quotas or, you know, I'm not sure that is the answer. I think it'll just breed resentment, breed kind of a whole lot of other problems. But you've got to kind of fix up the meritocracy uh, on the way through. And I think increasingly the pressure on boards will come from sh from outside mm. companies themselves Co investors will say well hang on you know there's only a, there's no women on that board mm. and they will make that uh, a kind of condition of investing and i think we have to be more clear about disclosure and reporting on it but you know there's just such a long way to go on this in in the corporate sector mm. lots of great improvements everything getting better but at a um, at a scholastic pace i have to say I think the entertainment industry still has a long way to go. I think women have sort of paved their way. There was a long period of time where uh, women were just your barrel girls. Um, we were women on breakfast shows were your giggly entertainment reporters who used to talk about their handbags and their shoes. Um, and then there are some really strong women who got into those positions and who just kept pushing forward. You know, I think there's women like your Erin Molans who got onto the footy show and went, yeah. I'm here because I'm good and I'm really good. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I don't know whether that answers your question, but I think the entertainment in industry absolutely has a long way to go. Um, and if there's ever beautiful young girls who will come in and sit on my breakfast show or uh, come out with me when I'm reporting for WIN, um, I'll just always say to them, multi-skill and just make yourself so good that they can't say no to you, you know? Which sometimes is tough. But... 
project when, like I felt really bad what happened with Kerry Bickmore because I am kind of like supporting her, mm. her kind of, her, her wealth, um, uh, the... Beans for brain cancer? Beans for brain cancer, so that's why I'm wearing a beanie even though this is a business event. Uh -huh. I, I, I mean, you have to kind of sympathize for, for women in entertainment that oh, sure. it's really in, in a men's world, especially with my sister who is a vascular surgeon and how that's predominantly a male's role and how there can be stigma when women kind of stand up for what they believe in mm -hmm. and you know you're supposed to be like be quiet quiet you know follow the rules but if you don't stand up for what you believe in mm -hmm. then you know how is the business going to change and as jennifer said if people see that that business is really not showing good ethics not showing that there are more women mm -hmm. more representation good qualities then why yeah. should I invest in that? And yeah. I believe that that should be a policy. So I really felt bad when you were in your position, when you know you were having that stigma with management, just mm -hmm. really brushing things aside and just saying, "Oh, you'll deal with it." Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in my position, I would not deal with it. But I'm not in entertainment; I'm in public sector, so yeah. that's a different <laughs> stigma. And I can, I'll answer it just quickly because I know that they'll, um, we should wrap, and that there'll probably be another couple of um, questions. But um, I worked with Carrie um, on her launch for Beans for Brain Cancer. There was a little beautiful girl here. I'm sh maybe some of you have heard of her beautiful little Annabelle Potts, who's currently in Mexico um, receiving treatment for her brain tumor. So um, we worked on that story, and that story was actually on the project that night. And you've got just got these beautiful women who um, are doing their best and they go out and sometimes you broadcast to, a, you know, an audience like this. Um, and it did happen to just be a night where she was launching a particular fundraising cause. And that was the same day that somebody with a very similar cause was, um, you know, launching their cause and it meant there was a clash. Um, and you know, she's trying to raise money for brain cancer and people are pulling her down because she should have looked in the diary and made sure that there wasn't really a clash. So um, I think to draw on to a couple of the things that Holly just sort of said, you've just got to find your tribe. And you know what? Sometimes you just, you can only be yourself and just do the best damn job that you can. And some people are going to go fantastic and some people are going to go, oh, you should have looked in the diary. Well. <laughs> Both of those causes sold out. Both of those causes made a stack mm. load of money. Um, but, you know, that was something that she was really sad about. So, unfortunately, sometimes when you front media organisations like that or shows like that, um, sometimes you put yourself out there and you do have to take a little bit of heat. And sometimes your energy source, you've just got to make sure that that's a big pool that you can dive into on days like that. Any more questions? How am I going for time, Hannah? Oh, I can, oh, I've got one more question. Um, I've got a quick question just about the attitudes thing because I actually had an interesting experience in Canberra the other, the other day where I went out to dinner with my dad and his work friends mm. and he works in agriculture and he works in a very male dominated industry. And there was one other woman there um, besides myself at a table of probably 15 to 20 and she was down the other end and I was up the other end with all the blokes and I just found myself listening to them talk about all the crazy women mm. in their department and the people that they work with and I just was kind of like not every woman can be crazy yeah that, that doesn't make sense that every woman that's in your office is just nuts you uh -huh. know <laughs> and I, I just got really frustrated and I guess you know that wasn't really a place for me to say anything about it um, then you'd be the crazy woman. Exactly, then I would be one of the crazy women and that's just how it goes, the hysteria mm. thing. Um, and yeah, I, I just don't really know how to approach those kinds of issues with the whole attitude thing. And I just mm. find it so frustrating. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you guys have encountered that and mm. how you think we can um, overcome that, I guess, in particularly male-dominated industries, but even in female-dominated ones. There's always the crazy woman stereotype of and course. I'm kind of sick of it. Yeah. 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 First of all, get some new friends, I think. Mm. <laughs> what do you, you think, go? girls? Steph? So, you know what that's reminding me of? A hundred years ago, um, I was at a dinner party and um, someone started telling an Aboriginal joke. Mm. And it was in the days when that was pretty commonplace. 
And I remember thinking, I've got a moral choice here. I can make myself incredibly unpopular or I can go home and feel ashamed of myself. And I remember taking a deep breath and saying, I'm sorry, but that's not okay. Mm. And the whole room stopped and everyone looked at me like I was a pariah. And I ended up walking out, leaving the dinner party and crying all the way home, feeling, you know, it was just this wave of hostility mm. towards me. Um, but it's, you know, in a very little sense, it's one of the things that I'm really proud of. Yeah, but, um, and I think that as hard as, it, hard as it is, even when it's your dad and all his mates, finding a way to say that's not okay mm -hmm. is all of our responsibility and it's the only way we'll change the world because mm -hmm. if every time we accept behaviour that's, that's not okay, um, it's just perpetuating that little mm -hmm. bit longer. What do you think, Holly? I was just going, I don't think I could top that. I thought that was so eloquently yeah. put and, and so wonderfully done. And I love hearing that you did that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, it's really interesting uh, watching these, these dialogues and, and jokes and, and, and watching almost people that are struggling to keep pace with the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. And even we've seen this, a lot of the, the political discourse, um, you know, wearing the, the I, until we all belong ring for marriage equality. I think probably Peter Dutton and, and versus uh, Joyce at the helm of Qantas is a great recent example of sort of some figures in conversations going, really, is that how you think? Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and it's interesting to see sort of obviously people responding to Jennifer's point to, to shareholders, to uh, customers, to people who are saying, no, the conversation's over here now and, and you're back there and that's not okay. And I think it is important you find a way to vocalise it. As, as someone who works uh, in the mining industry, the banking industry, and the legal industry going up, um, and sort of was typically in that male-dominated environment, if you're not able to start there sometimes in those conversations, um, and I understand that the difficulty when you're one of 20 at the table and dad's the one that's inviting you, uh, <laughs> then I think it's also the ability to, to, to make sure the conversation isn't indulged, to cut it off, even if you're not gonna call it, to cut it off and pivot it somewhere else. And I would often as well, have the stories and the examples and the leaders I'd pivot to that were women that were doing amazing things. Oh yeah, but how amazing was it that you know so and so led that incredible project last month and really pulled it off against the odds? And find those things where you can subtly make the point because it doesn't take too much nuance there to work out what you just did. Yeah, you're talking about all these crazy, well let me talk about all the amazing women in this industry. And I've met a few in the ag sector, particularly in the cotton industry, who are absolute game changers. So, Try and find those stories and examples as well. And give that feedback to your dad if you haven't had that conversation already. That's a really interesting conversation to say, I felt this way, I was an invitee of yours, they're your mates, how would you have wanted me to respond? Because I don't think it's acceptable that that was the tone of the conversation. And I'd love when you're in conversations like that in the future, dad, that you could be the person that says that. Mm. I'd be interested to hear his response too. <laughs> yeah. Because I think the response, you know, obviously just using the imagination would probably be, oh, it was just a joke. It was just funny. And I think, have that chat, good, good. Cool. Yeah. Good girl. Good on you. I was actually in Country Canberra in the first year that it happened. So he knows my position on it. Um, and he was, he was, he did do the whole thing. Oh, it was just a joke. It was just a joke. But, I think he kind of got it because my essay to country to Canberra was jokes are stupid. <laughs> like, 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 don't make them. That's awesome. <laughs> so Hannah, he, you've he got knows your, my viewpoint. But you've got yeah. your next Look at what you catalyzed. That's awesome. Yeah. Last questions, guys. Anyone else? I just want to add to that. You know, you come across Hold on, the mic's coming so we can all hear you. I'm sure everyone in the room has had that moment where you feel like you're in a position where you either say something or you don't. Mm. And it happened to me the other day at work, and I'm sure it's happened to so many people where I was watching Senate estimates as part of my role. Mm. And, um, so, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> She's and, going out in sympathy with you. <laughs> oh, and someone, and Penny Wong was speaking, and I, yeah, I love Penny Wong. I think she's fantastic. And a uh, quite senior person commented on her hair and said, mm. I can't believe she doesn't dye her hair. Oh my God. And I said, really? You can't believe that? Mm. And he said, no. And I said, oh, 
I actually find that really offensive. And he said, oh, okay. But even thinking about it now, I just felt so sick. And I thought, oh, I've got to say something because it wasn't the first comment. And I think you'll face it through your career, you'll face it in your personal life and you just have to have that courage Mm. to just pull it up. Totally agree. When it happens, and that's well, not why. your joke about jokes are bad. Mm. I actually think using humour is really Indeed. powerful. Mm. So you know, if you were to say, "So what? Gal Kelly's crazy." Okay, um, and then just go through. Like yeah. you were very funny when you were telling that story, yeah. and you can imagine sort of telling it back to people mm. in the way you did that people would just start to cringe mm. with humiliation. And sometimes I think a bit of counter humiliation is is a really good thing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Your know, humour is a powerful tool. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and so one of the things I always think is that let's, you know, you've got to be careful about being super mm. political, yeah. politically correct, because it's, it's in, a, in itself is a dangerous thing. But use humour because mm. it just, you know, like embarrasses people. Mm. And sometimes you've got to be willing to really embarrass somebody and say, what? Really? So, and, and, and then say to them, look at your own hair. Well, what? Let's, let's yeah. just start. <laughs> exactly. um, let's just deconstruct every single thing about your shoes, your shirt. Yeah. Go yeah. to town and see what happens. Brilliant. I'll never do it again. Yeah. yeah just offer your hairdresser. Yes, yeah, hilarious. <laughs> Anyone else ask questions? All right, ladies, the takeaway. The takeaway, the one piece of advice. Keep getting up each morning. <coughs> Make the world a better place. Mm. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Be and do what you really want to be and mm. do. Make it your um, your choice. Um, mm-hmm. The only person at the end of the day that you need to answer to is yourself. Uh, Courage. You've got to find courage. Courage in yourself. Courage to speak truth, truth to power. Uh, courage to take risks, and courage to fail. Mm. Yeah. And for me, I guess it's um, figure out what it is that you want, and then learn how to ask for it. Because mm. I think sometimes fi- figuring it out, going on a self date, as Holly <coughs> calls it actually figuring it out, shutting everybody else out, and it's not based on anybody else's assumptions or wants or needs, it's just you. Mm. What is it that you want? And then learn how to ask for it. Please put your hands together for our panel.